are recording now. There we are. Hello, Kimberly. Hello. Hello, Amy. Hi. And hello, Rachel. Hi. We're, we're welcoming back, Rachel. Rachel, you, you've done one or two of these with us now. These I did are... one with Kate right. Quinn for my launch of Mozart Code, and then right. one last year interviewing Janelle Sazelski for yeah. The Ice Swan. Which and is Janelle's a... got a new book coming oh, back yeah. out. So Absolutely. Coming the back. Brilliance of Stars. So if she yeah. needs me to pepper her with questions for that i'd be happy to do so <laughs> she's a delight so rachel <laughs> and, you're, and you're coming in from toronto correct yeah that's right yep. all right and amy is joining us from where are you joining in from tonight amy beautiful estes park colorado gorgeous 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 and kimberly's coming in from uh Martinburg, south carolina yeah i'm at the marriott, at the marriott? <laughs> oh, but hometown is actually uh near atlanta near atlanta all right well it is a pleasure to have all three of you here rachel's going to be in conversation with kimberly and amy um we just were talking in the green room we're going to go about probably 35 more like 45 50 minutes yeah. <laughs> So we're just going to chat. Gonna chat away, <laughs> stick with us. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, so those of you that are joining us on Facebook right now in that comment section that you have, if you're seeing this later, because I'm recording it and I'm going to put it on our YouTube channel. So we're not live with you if you're looking at us on YouTube, but it's going to be a great conversation. So stick with us. Um, but on the Facebook um, live that we're on right now, in that comment section, go ahead and put any questions that you might have for Kimberly and Amy, and I will feed those into Rachel into the conversation. So she'll pop them in as soon as you ask them. So, um, or whenever it feels right to pop them in <laughs> at her discretion, she'll pop those in. <laughs> so, so much power I have. So much power. <laughs> but we, love, we love the audience questions. So hopefully who's ever. Yes. Joined and these are two very, very friendly and accessible authors. So please yeah. do ask any questions. There's nothing off yeah. the table and um, don't forget to uh, prompt reason. prompt people for that when you're live too um yeah. when, when you're in the conversation too rachel just so that because I'll, I'll be chatting with them uh, but always a, a live prompt is always good too in that comment section and for those of you i didn't say this i asked you guys where you were at i didn't say where we're at um warwick's for those of you that don't know is in san diego in a little to a little suburb up called la jolla and um just about five or ten minutes up from the downtown proper area and my little sign there says 1896. So we've been in business for 125 years as of last year. Amazing. So, yeah. I know. Survived so two pandemics. Two pandemics. Yeah. Two pandemics. I think there's a book in there somewhere. Maybe we got to get Katie. Yeah. Or Sue Meissner, one of the locals. Dude, that's I, what I was going to say. Yeah. Might need to get into that. that survived the plague. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Nice. Couple couple world wars in there. I mean, it was, um, <laughs> we've survived quite a bit. Um, anyways, in that comment section, I'm going to put in both Amy and Kimberly's books as well. And so you can go ahead and click on those. Um, I, I know I say this a lot, but people oh. are so it's, yeah, there you go. Hold those books up. Um, I love the covers are both your covers are fantastic. Oh, they're, they're so Eleanor, good. the cover of Eleanor is so gorgeous. Shiny. Yeah. Look, it's shiny. Shiny. It's a, like it's a good cover. That, right? Gotta have that shine. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, what, and I, I know I say this too, that, and, and people are probably tired of hearing me say it, but, um, independent bookstores learned how to ship books over the, um, pandemic where we were actually oh, yeah. doing it before, but I think people discovered that we could do it. Yeah. So, um, so if you aren't in the San Diego area, click on those books, order them from Warwick's or support your local independent. We want to make sure that books are being purchased. If you're in the San Diego area, we'd love for you to stop by and see us because um, lots of good things to look at besides books in the store too. Yeah. I'm, we've can, chatted I way too send, long. Oh, go ahead, Amy. I was going to say, I'll send book plates so you can have a signed copy from Warwick's. Oh, if you yeah. want. There, you go. there you go. That's always a good, good incentive. So um, let me get you these intros and I get off screen and we can start the conversation. So Kimberly Brock is the award-winning author of The River Witch. She is the founder of Tinderbox Writers Workshop and has served as a guest lecturer for many regional and national writing workshops, including at the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Beloved Ooh. Pat Conroy. <laughs> um, she lives near Atlanta with her husband and three children, like she said. Amy K. Runyon writes to celebrate history's unsung heroines. She has been honored as a Historical Novel Society Editor's Choice Selection, 
as a three-time finalist for the Colorado Book Awards and as a nominee for the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writer of the Year. Amy is active as an educator and speaker in the writing community and beyond. Like she said, she lives in Colorado with her amazing husband. Um, two, I love this, usually adorable children. Love that. They, they have their moments. And two, always adorable cats, which we get to pro- probably get to see. We, we, we got a cameo year. of one of got them. some cameos yeah, earlier. G- Gigi may come back. Yeah. There you go. She might be finicky though, right? And oh, like yeah. he's, showed, he's very capricious. Yeah. <laughs> like they showed, uh, Kimberly showed her book. Uh, her latest book is The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare. And Amy's is The School for German Brides. Joining them is Rachel McMillan. We love as our interviewer always. Rachel is the acclaimed author of The Mozart Code, The Herringford and Watts Mysteries, The Van Buren and DeLuca Mysteries, and the three-quarter time series of contemporary Viennese romances. She's the author of Dream, Plan, Go, a travel guide to inspire independent adventure, which I love, which now that we're coming out of the pandemic, people know, are probably finally, out traveling. Right? Finally. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, you, you three have a great conversation. We'll see you in a little bit. Thank you so much, Julie. I am so excited to be here at Warwick's again from afar with uh, Kim Brock and Amy Runyon. And it's kind of cool because everybody watching, I am connected to these authors because I fangirled over them. So <laughs> I am it's telling true. you all now that if you like a book or if you find an author on social media, like do the nerdy thing and virtually stalk them like I did with Amy <laughs> Runyon, whose debut novel I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy of. And I loved it so much. I wrote a very rambling book gush about it. Um, and, <laughs> and that was such a been, lovely gush. <laughs> and Kim Brock, I had heard of many, many times because we share an editor. Uh, and I kind of stalked her until she became my friend. Uh, And now we have two amazing stories from these two women. And what I love is that both of your books are focused on, as Amy's bio said, carving out a space for women's voices in a way that, you know, none of the women in both of your books with the exception of the very luminous Eleanor Dare are perhaps those whose voices echo through history like an Amelia Earhart or like a Doris Day or any figure who's been fictionalized. So I want to start with you Kim and ask where did your story journey for the lost book of Eleanor Dare start? Was it a kernel? Did you always love the idea of Eleanor Dare? Will you give us a refresher course for people who may not know um, who Eleanor Dare was? Uh, I'm assuming any yeah. Canadian watching because she's not as popular over here. But can you, you tell know, us where that She's not started? as popular here as you would think. I think most people... Um, know the name Virginia Dare, which was Eleanor's child. Um, uh, We don't know very much at all about Eleanor. Most people might not know her name at all. They would just recognize the Dare last name maybe. Um, For me, I didn't really know about Eleanor Dare growing up. I think fifth grade maybe. And Amy, you probably were the same. Right around yeah, about. fifth grade, you have this lesson in, in history class in American history about a colony that disappeared off the coast of what's now North Carolina, what was then being called Virginia. And um, I think we remember it because it is a story without an ending, you know? So, and it's a little bit Twilight Zone too. So, when you're fourth, fifth grade, that's the one that sticks in your head and you remember and you wonder about it. And I was that kid that if there was a sign that said, don't go in here, or if there was a door or a key or a, that's what I did. I was into everything. So if there was a story of a bunch of people who disappeared, I really, that was my thing. I wanted to know. It was very Nancy Drew to me. So I was a young mother. I had two small children, 16 months apart. And the internet was new and they were taking naps. I was in North Carolina at the time. And 
I would sit down at my computer and just, I was kind of doodling through history for my first novel. And I ran across this article about the Dare Stones, which was this obscure discovery in the 1930s that I had never heard anything about. And it was part of Georgia history where I was from. And I thought, why don't I know about this? How can I not know about this? And so I dug around a little bit about it and it kind of became obsessed. And the Dare Stones were these stones that were found in the 1930s, supposedly a message from Eleanor Dare, who was the daughter of the governor of the colony at Roanoke, the mother of Virginia Dare. And the stones say that after the colony disappeared, there was a massacre and her husband and child were killed and she was one of only a few survivors. Her initials EWD were on the stones and it was this big deal in our country at the time. People thought they were authentic for a while before they were completely dismissed as a hoax. And I just, I became obsessed with the idea of this woman's story, whether that stone was true or not, I was thinking about her because of it. And so I spent uh, maybe 20 years trying to decide how to write a story for her. And I thought, you know, if I'd been Eleanor and I was 19 and my husband and my child were dead and I'd lost everybody and everything I'd ever loved and I was standing on the edge of the world, all I really would want was to be remembered. So that's where this story oh, came that. from. And the whole idea of naming and names. And obviously the Roanoke colony is so every year at Halloween, if you go to BuzzFeed and you look, really, really? I'm, I, you can see top 10 unsolved mysteries of all time. And the fact that you have reclaimed a space for someone who ultimately would have been wiped out from history altogether, which I yeah, find very just... much so. And more than once, because with the first mystery, we lose her story. And, and I think that's true for so many women in general. You know, here's Eleanor. She was a girl. She got married. She had a baby. She disappeared. And that's kind of how women's history goes in my country mm -hmm. anyway. But I... I felt like she disappeared twice because she disappeared again when those stones were dismissed and mm -hmm. the college where they're housed, you can go and visit them and, but they're very discreet about it because it was kind of embarrassing to them. And I love that history. I hope people will look it up and just learn a little bit about it because it's fishy. I don't know if the stones are real or not. Probably not. Uh, maybe the first one though. Nobody has ever been able to prove or disprove the first one. And I think that's cool. I love that inauthenticity can sometimes trigger some mental or imaginative journey. Sure. Um, and I really do love, before we switch to Amy for this question, I do love that, as you said, when you were first exploring with us your journey with this book, that you mentioned a key, because the key plays yeah. a major part in the cover. So how brilliant is that? Can you show the cover just again? Um, and while she's holding that up, I'm going to remind anyone who's just joining now that you can put any comments you have or questions or statements or emojis like lots of hearts <laughs> into the Facebook comments and I will make sure that if they're in real time I will read them to the authors and we'll get there but if they're a little bit after I know that Kim and Amy will go back and check the Warwick's Facebook and make sure that your questions are answered so Amy you are not new to this whole reclaiming and carving out a space for women's voices in fact I first met you on the page and then in <laughs> Facebook mm -hmm. chat from stalking you because I was such a fan because you were telling a story about the Fee de Wah, which is a huge mm -hmm. part of Canadian history. The daughters yes, of the so that's, Congress, that, yeah. that's our connection, our Canadian <laughs> yeah. connection. Our Canadian connection, which has flourished, but now you are tackling something that I feel is very wonderfully resonant and brave because you are carving out your own space in the absolute plethora and Leviathan of World War II publishing. Yes. So, tell a story about the school for German brides. So I know that 
this comes from your research from mm -hmm. another book. Can you extrapolate a little bit on how yes. this came about? So I was writing Across the Winding River, which is a triple narrative. It takes um, that sh that is the story of an American medic in the war. A male is my only male POV character I've ever written. Uh, but it's Max. a good one. Oh, I love <laughs> Max. Max Blumenthal um, is my character, and he's based on um, a real human being that was the father of a friend of mine. And I won't get into that whole story because it's the funniest thing. When I was writing Daughters of the Night Sky, met this woman who told me all about her dad. And I woke up three days later and said, I'm sorry, new friend, Carol, but I'm going to have to write a book about your dad. And you're just going to have to be get really cool with that. And <laughs> um, so that's that's how that happened. But um, so Max is one POV character. And then you have Johanna who was a pilot in the Luftwaffe, um, even she was she was of mixed heritage. She was um, a Michelin, um, she had Jewish, a Jew, um, she didn't have official papers um, that verified that she was completely Aryan. And I think she had one Jewish grandparent, so which was Jewish enough to get you into a lot of trouble um, in Nazi Germany. And then the third POV is uh, Max's daughter, Beth, and there's a family mystery. But, um, to, uh, intertwined throughout this family mystery is a character named Meta, who is Johanna's sister, and she gets married to um, a very high-ranking Nazi official. And so I knew I had to feature the wedding, and I started doing the research for their wedding because I figured Nazis did had their own thing for everything, and I had to to research Nazi weddings, and they were strange, of course, but I came across the fact that they had bride schools, which were, as the name says on the box, there are schools where um, women were taught uh, and they said, oh, you've, you've been stuck in an office job. We're going to take you out of your, you know, and give you some time to recuperate before you, you get married and do your service to the fatherland, which is to um, provide, you know, you do your part to create a strong German family which is to be a good wife, have multiple children and raise them to be strong, healthy children. And of course, with a big dose of Nazi propaganda to, uh, to round it all out. And I read about these and I'm like, OMG, this is Stepford Wives Nazi style. And I could just imagine this character coming in who's, you know, very bit subversive. And it was like the Nightingale meets the Stepford Wives. I'm like, there's a book there. There's a big book there. And I shelled it because I was trying because I was told by my prior publisher we're done with World War II for you for a while we're we, we're full up on World War II, and so I pitched a Gilded Age novel which uh, plays into uh, Rachel's life because we're using that. <laughs> um, but I uh, but I so I um, I was pitching more widely and um, I was talking to the folks at William Morrow and they said, well, what else do you have in your back pocket? Um, when they rejected the Gilded Age idea because nobody said they want a Gilded Age two years ago and now they do. Um, Thank said, you, well, Matt got... Gala. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I said, I said, you know, I've got the story about this woman who goes to a German bride school and, you know, she's orphaned and um, she gets sent to live with her aunt and uncle who are from the countryside and they live in Berlin and she's a, you know, a town girl in a country in the city you know, country mouse visit the city and um, very much a fish out of water and she gets swept up in the Nazi propaganda and uh, just the, the, the fear of Nazi. And it starts in 1938. So that it's, you know, it's right before the war when things are really starting to escalate. And um, I pitched it to my wonderful editor, Tessa Woodward at William Morrow. And she said, you know what you need though, is you need also a Jewish protagonist because we cannot have a good German uh, narrative. And I'm like, no, that, first of all, that was never the intent. I consider my protagonist to be very morally gray. Um, but, it, you know, I started thinking about, well, what role could a, a, a second protagonist, Tilda, play in this? And, um, you know, I realized it's kind of, they're all German brides. Tilda gets married very early in the story. That's not a spoiler, it's important. And um, she, uh, you know, their, their circumstances in their courtships and their relationships with their significant others are both, you know, that are taking place in the same city at the same time are so radically different. And 
um, just their experience at the same period of time being so radically different, I thought was a, a you know, a really interesting mirror. And so um, I took that idea, I wrote like one or two chapters from her point of view, and it was like, boom, there's Tilda. And um, so there, there you go. That was how it became. I, and that, yeah. I love it. And I'm going to put a pin on anything more about Tilda, because I have another question that will okay, allow us great. to dig deeper into her. Um, but what I want to tell readers, again, reminding you that you can put questions and comments in is Daughters of the Night Sky is actually about the night witches. Um, so yes. if you... Yeah. I know a lot of you have read The Huntress. If you want a slightly different experience that is its own book, but reading more about these amazing female pilots, um, definitely pick that up. Uh, and Amy is just, it's amazing how she is able to capture the ideology that lured these women who, yeah. of course, we have the privilege of historical hindsight. We know how evil all of this was, but it's quite different to be a young woman in your twenties yeah. and think that you're doing something good. So I love that yeah. you pinpointed the moral. Well, Hannah, yeah. Hannah is 17 at the beginning of the story. Yeah. She's trying to finish growing up. And that was an article I read as well when I was researching for Across the Winding River is just the antipathy that the teenagers in Berlin had even up until like 1944. They're like, the, it's all the grownups talk about is boring. We're done with the war. It's kind of like being done with COVID. It's like, well, it's not done with you. It's true. And, and um, it's, you know, they're just bored. And, you know, it's kind of that, you know, and I think it's an important developmental phase. Teenagers are selfish. Often, I mean, there are some that have a larger world perspective. Yes, it's great. But, you know, a lot of times I think it is very important because they're trying to figure out who they are and their place in the world. They, you know, it's just they cannot think in these big, broad terms and, you know, about the ramifications of, you know, marching with the Nazis or subverting the Nazis. I mean, it's 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 a big thing. It is. Yeah. And it's a, I love the complex nature of that book. Um, we do have a mm -hmm. few comments. Susan says Eleanor Dare's cover is gorgeous. It of is. Me, and I know it is. Uh, and Janelle, who we love and was here last year, and we were talking about the Ice Swan, which also has a gorgeous cover. Yes. She says, y'all look amazing. Well, Janelle is someone who owns possibly the greatest hats in the history of yes time. she does. We all appreciate your uh, checking us out. So the next question that I have for both of you is around the burden of writing historical fiction so that you allow yourself the privilege of being inspired by your very clear and deep muses from these story kernels, but also allow for your imagination and your creativity and artistry to take a place within your book. So Kim, how did you balance staying authentic to your best understanding of the dare stones and eleanor dare's echo throughout the ages while still allowing yourself the propensity to have compulsive needs to write beautiful language your, your book is so beautifully written and again you're, you're both fiction authors we do not have phds in these periods how, how did you allow yourself to have some playful fun while still allowing for the authenticity that I find within the lost book of Eleanor Dare. I tell people um, right off the bat that I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian. Amy is much, much more of a historian than I am. I am a storyteller and that's how I approach this book. Um, but when I turned in my first draft of this novel, it was only the story set in 1945, right at the end of World War II, right. a mother and a daughter. And I had chosen to start there because I liked the idea of, you know, I know when the date on the stone is 1591. I know when it was found in 1937. So those are the two different mysteries the mystery I was interested in was who it would have mattered to. So maybe where was that stone all of that time in between and who did that story matter to? So I started it after the stone had been completely dismissed and who I thought it would have mattered to would have been one of Eleanor's descendants if that story had passed from generation to generation, mother to daughter. 
But when I turned it in, it was just that. It was just Alice and Penn and them grappling with the end of the war, not knowing they're at the end of the war. What's coming next? Who are we? Is this true? And my agent said, this is beautiful. I love it. Now, where's the rest? So if Don't you hate it about, what nobody ever wants to hear. I know, like <laughs> the big book. What more do you want? Like, I just that, but that's what you're asking is, you know, how do you give yourself permission to kind of, and I, I fought her for about six weeks because I, I told her, I said, this doesn't feel right. I, I don't feel like I have the authority or it's not my place to, I felt like I was stomping through a graveyard, you know, and just, it felt disrespectful to make something up about this woman. And I don't know why it bothered me. So I'm still, when I talk to readers about it while I've been on book tour, I'm still kind of trying to figure that out. Um, because my agent was like, well, then what's the point? You know, the whole point of this book is to tell your story. You want to tell Eleanor's story. Why aren't you telling Eleanor's story? And I fought her for about six weeks and I woke up at like two in the morning one night and I could hear it. And it wasn't what I had tried to do. I had tried to do that very traditional dual timeline thing where you have the, you know, the, the timeline for Eleanor and you get her whole story and you have the timeline for 1945 and the mother and daughter. And it just was not working. And I didn't care anything about Eleanor. And I was devastated because I did, I wanted to figure it out. But when I woke up, I could hear this thing and it was not that it was it was a story. And I thought, who is that? Who is that talking? Who is that telling this story? And I realized it was a mother. It was a story like you would tell your child and like you would pass along in a family. And I realized then it was a mother story. It was a fable. It wasn't the truth. It had truth in it. Because you don't always get the truth from your mom or not the whole truth anyway, right? Or maybe they meet it out and sometimes they run out of time and you don't get it all. You don't get an answer. And that's really what this book turned into at that point. So I wrote Eleanor's tale at that point. And I tried to imagine not necessarily what the dare stones say happened to her but what I thought might have happened to her based on research that I did about how a woman might have moved through that period of history when America was first being colonized. And then each generation after that, I had to kind of just pick and choose where I thought they might have wound up and how, and give you just a little insight into how women moved through history in different ways. So that's where it came from. And that's kind of how I got around it. <laughs> I didn't tell no, the truth. I told the story. <laughs> brilliant. And what I find so prescient about what you're saying is that the story of Eleanor Dare as told through your book is a lot more about the questions that are being asked as right. this echoes through history rather than a finite conclusion. And it looks like that kind of mimics your experience in writing the book is that you just always had questions. So I want to remind readers that when they read the lost book of Eleanor Dare, you are not reading a biography of Eleanor Dare because why would you want one? What you want is the influence of in a tradition, an oral and narrative tradition that is very much a man's story of colonization of the early yes. time. You know, the, all the explorers who are there are not like, exactly. I claim this Where Virginia girls? shoving off the people who were here in the first place and colonizing the land. What would women have told their daughters to claim a little bit of their own experience? And so Oh gosh, you're a smart cookie. I think you're. I don't know about that. I just, I thought, you know, I don't. There's, there's so many things I'm never gonna know, and I think what this book is really about is that: is how do you, how do you leave the stone in the woods and move forward when you're, you're never gonna know what the whole truth was about so many things, and maybe that's what love is, you know, and that's what's really being passed down is the ability 
to not know everything about someone that you love and still love them. I think that's what the book is really about. And the theme that women especially don't always get the mm -hmm. final say either in record or in paintings or in descriptions yep. because they were very much silenced by a uh, patriarchal realm. So I posit this question to Amy, you had quite a different uh, burden and hurdle to climb because you are, and I want to reiterate as Amy will, that we are speaking in terms of a morally gray world. Mm -hmm. She is trying to sympathize or at least draw out some sympathetic tenets of something that we can only look at as an elegant type of horror given our historical perspective yeah. so right. yeah. um yeah. I don't, how did you and i i don't want you quite man i'm bossy i don't quite want you to talk about sensitivity readers yet because we're going to get there um but if you could talk about how personally when you're just writing up that draft how did you ensure that you were encapsulating the very morally gray and Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. horrendous dark um positioning of what these women were buying into yeah well and the reality is i think that a lot of people didn't realize how, i mean unless you were really really high up in the echelon it's just you know a lot of people weren't fully you know cognizant of how awful everything was until it got i mean it just it you know it happens so slowly and so gradually but so steadily that you just get swept up in it it's like adding one stone to a pile until yeah. you're crushed and so i think that's how the nazi movement because you know it was it started back in the 20s the nazi movement started and it took you know almost 20 years to really reach its zenith and so i think that that the slow the slow but the slow but steady progression of their policies or their ideology, you know, people were so swept up in it that it was because it was so slow and so steady is how it was able to get a foothold. Um, and so I have a character, Hana, who was raised by a woman who was very dubious of the Nazi um, ideology. Um, she was a doctor. And the big, the big, the, you know, the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back for Hana's mother, Elka, um, was that she was no longer allowed to practice medicine. She was a doctor. And in 1936, and you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that's right, um, women uh, and Jewish folks were no longer allowed to practice medicine outside and women only uh, within the realm of midwifery and Jewish people not at all. And um, so I, I, that was what really, you know, set her mother you know, because they, you know, she, they're out in the in the countryside. So this is not like being in downtown Berlin where they're surrounded by it. It was subtle influences. The smaller the town, usually the less Nazi influence there was from what I understand. But she, she was like, yeah, to heck with all these guys once they told her she couldn't practice medicine. So Hannah grew up with that kernel of mistrust. But then fast forward to, to when she's 17, her mother has died and her father ships her off to live with his brother and his sister-in-law. So that would be Hannah's aunt and uncle. And um, she is just trying to, I mean, she's, this is like, he sends her off like two weeks after her mother has died. So she's still reeling from this incredible loss because she was tight with her mother. Um, and you know, she was traipsed through the woods, you know, um, with her mother going to visit patients in secret and everything. And so she goes and she discovers very quickly that her aunt and uncle are very high in the Nazi echelon. And they're not particularly warm or kind people. Um, you know, certainly her aunt is trying, you know, buys her new clothes and, you know, treats her like, because they were childless and not by choice. And so um, they're, they're trying to spoil the mother, the mother figure, Charlotte, Aunt Charlotte is especially trying to spoil her. And so she's like, you know, this isn't me. But, you know, she's trying, like most young women would want to do in that situation, to please these people who are going out of their way to be kind to her. Now, granted, we find out that there is an ulterior motive 
um, for them trying to, you know, mold her into this perfect young woman. Um, and that culminates in her going off to the bride school. Um, but, you know, I tried to think about it because Hana is young. And so I think that she is, uh, you know, especially as, er, you know, she becomes more and more complicit as the story goes on. However, you know, she's young and naive. And so I give her this much of a pass and, you know, but that, that pass, you know, becomes less and less valid throughout the course of the book. But she's surrounded by people who are way more aware of the evil they are doing. And so, um, but, you know, I remember when I was writing Duty to the Crown and I had an evil character in that book and I had a beta reader, um, a critique partner, Gwen Florio say, you cannot make anybody this evil. Like there's, I mean, there's, no, there's no, everything in life is shades of gray. There is no morally white, no morally black. You've got to make him, you know, give him a dog that he's kind to something, something, you know, some redeeming character, characteristic. And so that's what I tried to think about. I tried to think about Gwen's words as I was writing some, you know, the special, the three evil characters would be Friedrich, Uncle Otto and Aunt Charlotte, those are the three worst in the book um, uh, that I can think of off the top of my head, um, since Hitler doesn't actually make a cameo, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, they're, they're terrible. And, but I think about, you know, what are their redeeming characteristics? Because, you know, there, there's gotta be something in these people to make them human and relatable. And so that was the process and it was uncomfortable. It was hard. But the, the truth of the matter is, you know, I think that it is important when we look back with, you know, a zillion years of perspective, you know, since World War II is so long ago now at this point, to re, you know, we, if we want to figure out and to stop this from happening again, because the Holocaust survivors and our World War II veterans, they're all leaving us um, as time, you know, the, the march of time goes on. If we want to truly do justice, we have to understand how it happened. And to understand how it happened, we have to get inside the head of the people who allowed it to happen and the people who pushed it forward. And those are actually, uh, you know, those are two kind of interwoven groups of people. Think of the Venn diagram. Um, you know, the people who were just allowed it to happen and the people who pushed it forward. And um, we see, uh, you know, people that are all on that spectrum in the course of the School for German Brides. And um, it's hard. It's, you know, at times it was gross. And this is a book I wrote in the middle of the lockdown. I was homeschooling my children because their schools were shut. And, you know, this is a book I wrote in 300 word stretches from like 10 at p.m. to 2 a.m. And it was a dark, hard, head place to be in during a dark, hard place in my life. And I think that that's kind of why I was able to do it because I was able to dig deep into, um, you know, the, you know, kind of the rock bottom part of my psyche to be able to make these characters real. And the dimension and the dichotomy of having something that, you know, we don't completely and fully understand. It's so easy to label people in this cartoonish way that they're either fully horrible or fully good. And yet one of the things that readers might find unsettling while reading a school for German brides is the fact that it's so easy for us right now to say, well, I would never be that way, or I would never do that, but it's so. I'd have also, Jewish people in my basement. Yeah. It's a, no. you know, I would risk my life no, you every wouldn't. day. It's, no, you it's wouldn't. very hard, hard when you're living through it. So this mm -hmm. kind of bridges and, oh my gosh, these, I, I want to say that I, I see the question and I'm going to um, cut some of my own because this question from a reader is so good. And we're all at 940. I knew that you guys would have wonderful things to say, but I did want to bridge into a fact that you both are working with characters, narratives, and voices that are not um, indigenous to your own experiences. Mm -hmm. And right now in any arena of publishing, we are often talking about the appropriation of voice and who has the right to tell what story. And so this kind of allows me to talk to you about how both of you were privileged enough to work with sensitivity readers who were all, who were able to give you the feedback that you needed to delicately 
and authentically to the best of your limited experiences in these realms lead you to be able to present these characters on the page. So Kim, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, when and how did you use sensitivity readers in the Lost Book of Eleanor Dare? Um, well, I, I wrote a draft of the novel, a complete draft of the novel before I approached a, a dear friend who was a sensitivity reader for this book. And I, my feeling about this is, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think any of us know what we're doing. Yeah. And I wanted to say, look here, I'm getting this all wrong. I know that. And I need your perspective. And I tried my best as a a person who is very aware that I'm in a really privileged position to be able to write this book and send it out into the world to into publishing and expect that it it will be received and read and maybe ahead in the line because of who I am and I did not want to put something out there that was like you said was not my place to tell it i i wanted to be a an instrument right but not necessarily my place to be a voice on some of the things that i was oh, writing about gosh okay i just kind of want to watch this back and then sew everything that you're saying into <laughs> a pillow or a quilt because you have some amazing nuggets tonight Kim. i don't know i, I don't I, know how you're the doing nuggets this. Of it's wisdom. Hard to, the nuggets of wisdom i lost a lot of sleep over it For i mean how like do you sure. write a novel wow. about colonization first of all here's my poor white girl story about colonization right and i'm pre i'm writing about pre-revolutionary america yeah. and and all the way up through world war ii so there's so many injustices there's so many places and my characters are white they're young white women so i guess the only saving grace is that they're as stupid as me you know and i i'm writing from their perspective this very limited perspective of a 13 year old white girl and her mother at the end of world war ii and they're trying to grapple with the same things i'm trying to grapple with in 2022 again so, those questions oh yeah i love your insatiable questions um and i do want to break because somebody did ask what the definition of a sensitivity reader is and Honestly, in the publishing sphere, it's usually somebody who is the best person to speak to the experience the author is attempting to capture, but doesn't have in their own personal backgrounds. So often, if you have, and we'll use this to seg to Amy, for example, Amy is not Jewish. However, she has a Jewish heroine in her book. That's when you have someone either hired by the publisher or in Kim's case, a friend who is able to read through the experience you're capturing from someone who doesn't have the same life background as you do and shines a light or ensures that you are presenting this person in the most uh the most respectful way so that because it, it can be very difficult and we've all seen with books in the past how without sensitivity readers often people mm -hmm. can feel that they're not well represented by someone who doesn't have that same experience and it can cause a bit of fissure uh so the very intelligent and compassionate author ensures that their work is vetted by people who perhaps have a better perspective of certain things. So Amy, um, you also used a sensitivity reader to ensure yes. that the Jewish experience in School for German Brides is presented in a way that is authentic, but also compassionate. Uh, yes. And yeah, talk a little yes. bit about that. 
so and you know i i did not grow up jewish i actually was raised in a quasi catholic household um and you know there are, i i kind of think that judaism and catholicism are interestingly parallel in that there's a cultural element. You can be Jewish, but not religious, and you can be Catholic without oh, being religious. True. So there's that parallel. Um, and of course, they're so vastly different, but I, I like to think that it sort of feels the same in a certain respect. And the two things they absolutely do have in common is that there is no one way to be Catholic and there is no one way to be Jewish. They are big, big diasporas. Um, and so I mean, there, there are going to be Jewish readers, and I've had one or two comments, very, very kind comments from folks who read The School for German Brides who thought I got some of the parts of Judaism wrong. But there is, a, you know, it's, it's a very challenging thing um, because there, you know, it, it is something that is such a wide cultural experience, what it is to be Jewish. And I've studied it extensively, but there is no, there is no making up for not having been raised in the culture. And ha yes, I have tons of Jewish friends, ton, you know, uh, you know, Jewish people in my family, um, but it's not the same. It is not the same as, um, you know, a, as actually being um, born and raised and, and, and integrated into the culture. So um, my, my editor at William Morrow is Jewish. And she, in addition, because it is such a wide diaspora, she hired another Jewish sensitivity reader on top of that um, to read and to make sure I wasn't falling into any tropes and this sort of thing. You know, that one of the big tropes is that, you know, Jewish folks in World War II were basically just lambs to the slaughter. They didn't try to get out. They were, you know, they, you know, it was just, um, you know, they, they just kind of accepted their fate. And that's a horrible trope. And I absolutely, you know, I tried very hard to avoid that. They were, you know, um, Tilda from page one is trying to get her mother out and then herself, you know, she's worried about her mother first and her second. And the reason being, um, and one of the, the de decisions I made was to make Tilda um, a Mischling, which is half Jewish, half Aryan. Her father is Aryan and abandons her family to save his law practice. He's a lawyer. And Tilda always wanted to be a lawyer. Her grandfather on her mother's side was a lawyer, and she always aspired to be like her, gra her, her grandfather. And, but because, you know, Tilda was born at the beginning of the rise, you know, because again, this is 20 years and she's in her early 20s. So she was born, um, you know, like 1918 ish. Um, and I don't have my concordance with me, so I can't remember exactly her <laughs> birthday. Sorry, guys. But um, yes, I keep a list. I love that you have a concordance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, like between managing my two children's schedules and, you know, my own life and everything, and the cats. I have to have a concordance. <laughs> oh, the cats, you know. Yeah. No, it's, you know, the great thing is my husband, Jeremy, loves a cat. So he takes over a lot of cat care. So that's really <laughs> nice. Um, but, you know, um, with uh, I decided to make her. I mean, but, I mean, I love the part. You know, the 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 Aryan men who abandon their Jewish wives and their Jewish children um, be, to save their own skin. Um, I thought that was really compelling. But also because Tilda grew up with both traditions for a good chunk of her life, that her experience is going to be not purely Jewish and not purely um, Aryan. Um, because her father was kind of a non-religious um, German per, per person, um, you know, and it makes her, she, she, her, she's not as dark as her mother. She has green eyes. She has lighter brown hair, softer skin. And um, so she's able to pass off as Aryan before they were, you know, the, they had the stars and everything. So that gives her a passport through Berlin um, when I needed her to have one. Um, but um also, growing up, I mean, it's not like you could brazenly go to services at a synagogue um, throughout most of her childhood. And so she's not going to be enmeshed in the Jewish culture to the same degree that uh, a lot of uh, Jewish folks, you know, say you're, you know, Jewish living in, um, you know, a, a, you know a, a, like an a Orthodox neighborhood in Brooklyn, you know, you get to be very enmeshed in your culture. She didn't have that um that experience and so it makes it um easy to make her slip up from time to time it, it kind of makes it um, a little bit more authentic that she wouldn't necessarily get everything right one example and i actually you know the the my um sensitivity reader told me not to make a white gown for her baby 
because that's like a christening gown and Jewish people right. wouldn't do that. Okay, but they would have, you know, a, a, something similar for um, a naming ceremony or a bris. But, you know, I thought, you know what, German women at the time dressed their babies in all white. And, and, and often it was very impractical. I don't know why they did it. Um, having raised two children of my own, I think it's insane. But they dress their babies in white a lot. And you know what, she's not just Jewish, she's also German. And I thought that that would be, and she saw this beautiful fabric because she runs a fabric shop, even though she wants to be a lawyer. That's what the lot she was given in life. And she sees this beautiful white fabric and she wants to make something beautiful for her unborn child. And so I, I left it. And um, I kind of stand by that decision. Um, and of course, I'm using the qualifier kind of, but I stand by that decision because I feel like she was somebody who felt very much between both cultures. And can I that's, say something? Yeah, I'm listening do. to you. And what I'm thinking about is, is I think that that's the heart of it. When, when you're writing about the things that we have a sensitivity reader read for us, what my goal is, is to, to show a character struggling with that thing whatever that thing is, mm -hmm. um, not getting it right all the time, like what you just mm -hmm. said, because the whole point of writing a story is to show your character's progression, to show them trying to work through some of the things that we may be working through in our own time and exactly. our own lives. And so it's a, it's a learning process. And it's a, like what Rachel said, it's about respect. It's about knowing when to open your mouth and when to be an observer, um, mm -hmm. and for your characters to display that, because if you if your characters are know-it-alls, who cares? Mm -hmm. Who cares? Who wants to follow them through anything? And who, I and that's one of the things I was I was hoping the most would I would get right if I get anything right in this book is to show that these women are they're standing in the middle of the same mess that everybody has always been standing in the middle of it's not a new mess it's not new to them it's not new to us and they're trying to figure out what to do about it what's their place in it what they've caused what they can help with maybe what they can't help with mm -hmm. so that's what i think when you have a sensitivity reader you, you say hey, we're in the mess together. Tell me, am I getting this right? And we have another follow-up question about sensitivity readers. And I just want to say that part of the conversation around having sensitive sensitivity readers is to ensure that all of the publishing slots and the voices that are telling experiences by, in this case, white authors are yeah. not diminishing or taking away the voices or experiences from authors right. of a different experience who also deserve to have their books and voices mm -hmm. published. Um, but an excellent question. It's kind of neat that this is coming up. I love that people are engaged in learning about this because I guess we talk about it. Shop talk and publishing. I talk to these two ladies. I whine at these two ladies all the time and they always listen to me. It's amazing. Um, do authors give credit to sensitivity readers in the acknowledgements? I know that there is discussion over who is qualified to write in certain stories if they haven't lived the experience of the fictional characters. And yes, and there's a lot of nuance to this discussion. And I don't think like a school for German brides, we talked about morally gray. There's not one fit answer, yeah. but um, can you- I'm trying to remember. Your, uh, I know that uh, Amy's editor, Tessa Woodward, on Twitter is Tessa of Avonlea. How amazing is it that she goes I by that know. handle? And I've got um, Anne of Green Gables right here in a place of honor. Oh, that's that's lovely. But I know that she um she is Jewish and she ensured that Amy had somebody who, but in you said, Kim, that it was a friend of yours. Several um, friends. And yeah. they're credited, you know, I, I definitely acknowledge them, but do I credit them as in particular, a sensitivity yeah. reader? No, it kind of feels like outing something secret between you or there's something, I don't know. I, I, I It might be a I case just, by case scenario yeah, with authors. And I, yeah. I, I do thank them in my acknowledgements. Of course I do. Yeah, but no, I'm not specific about. 
But I will say that sometimes publishers actually hire people, mm -hmm. um, people that they've worked with before, people who are well-renowned in the industry. They are brought in for certain manuscripts. Sorry, Amy, go Which ahead. I think I, yeah, I was going to say, I never actually had direct contact with my sensitivity reader. Um, so yeah. I may or may not have known her name. I know it was a she. I'm not sure I actually knew her name. Um, because it was given to me as a memo and um, basically they said you know it was you can take these suggestions or not and um, but it was I think it was a point where I'm not sure I could have even added her to the end um, but um, you know uh, so no I didn't thank her um, even though I am so grateful so absolutely grateful for the input that was made by my sensitivity reader in the book um, and no, I didn't take every note, but I took a lot of them. I took the vast majority of them because certainly um, she is a um, a better uh, a, has a better understanding of Jewish culture than I do. Despite having, you know, I've tried so hard. You know, I've been it's you know the, a culture that I've been interested in for you know decades. I remember we had a Holocaust survivor come to my middle school, and I read his book um, Barry Spaniard, who's passed away not too long ago. I think maybe within the last ten years. And, um, you know, just being so utterly moved by his story and no, I could never tell a story, you know, his story, but I feel like, you know, the way I've done it here, I feel like, um, well, I mean, I'm appropriating, you know, till a Hama story as much as I am Tilda's cause I didn't survive going to a bride school either. Um, but, and I have, you know, I actually don't have much German heritage at all either, but, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a fine line. I think it's all comes down to, could somebody, you know, is there somebody who needs to be doing this aside, uh, you know, other than me? Um, you know, I remember reading before it was a book. I remember hearing the story about um, the woman, the women of fugitive color or what was no hidden, hidden figures. Um, and I'm like, I can't write that story. I don't know what it was like to be in a, a, a that, you know, oppressed to that degree and to be, you know, stymied so much in my field as those women were, and I'm not a woman of color. And so, um, you know, I remember, I just remember, you know, before I realized it was actually been going to be a book and been optioned into a movie then you know, my head just rattling through who are my African-American author friends, my black author, female friends who could write this book. And thankfully it was already a book, um, but it was, um, you know, cause that's, that's just where my brain goes. When I think, you know, I could not, this is not my story. Um, it's not for me to tell, but um, Hannah's story and eventually Tilda's story called to me enough. that I'm like, yeah, I, I do need to be the one to tell this story. And I'm really glad I did. And so I have um, one more reader question. If anybody else has any last minute reader questions bundle them in. Um, but before I get to those, we are <laughs> almost at 10 o'clock. It's because these stories are so interesting and these authors are so smart. But before we get to that, I do want to ask, uh, because I am a voracious bookworm, I want to ask each of these ladies if they can recommend or at least give us a peek behind the curtain of insight into what they're reading and loving right now. Can you give us some book recs that people can order from Warwick's? <laughs> because Warwick says everything or can get yeah. everything. <laughs> well, I haven't read it yet, but I've read the other books in the series. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Emma Project by Sonali Dev, which is oh, yeah. a series so of Jane Austen. Yes, I love Sonali and she is absolutely wonderful. And um, it's a series of Jane Austen retellings, but present day with an Indian American, <laughs> Eastern Indian American family, the Rajas. And so um, the Emma Project is obviously an Emma retelling. And of course, it started with Pride, Prejudice and other flavors, which and then we had Recipe for Persuasion and um, Incense and Sensibility, which is the oh, best so title smart. ever. So good. Um, so smart. Yes. And I love those covers, too. And those oh, are really so beautiful. Luscious so beautiful. atmospheric ones. Um, and he, I think she's trying to find one for us. So of course she's got <laughs> there her go. library. There oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. You, we are in my library and I surround myself with the books written by friends. Um, even it's if I so get nice. an advanced review cover, I, I want to have, this feels like a giant hug from the literary community. Yeah. These, uh, so many of these books. Okay. Yeah. We got Les Miserables and we've got Anne of Green Gables, but we, you know, a lot of these books are written by friends. And to have them here with me in the room next to right where I write all my books, 
Um, you know, it, it just feels like I've got, you know, my, my um, writing pals in the room with me and it's, it's just a warm, happy thing. And Amy is one of thing. Amy is one of the most supportive writers in the history of time. She is always um, checking out on people. She is always promoting other people. It's ridiculous. And Kim is the same. So Kim, what book can you talk to us about? Been here in my stinking empty Marriott room. In your oh, Marriott God. hotel room. <laughs> um, I want. I just picked up a copy of In the Face of the Sun by Denise Bryce. I'm so excited oh, to read it. I want it so bad. Um, and then um, let's see, Take My Hand. Oh gosh, what's her name? Uh, Dolan Valdez. Yeah. You know her? Um, and then today, and I'm picking this up this week while I'm on tour, The Book Woman's Daughter, Kim Michelle Richards. Oh, I can't wait for that yeah, one. Yeah, me too. I'm tour. so excited about that one. I love her. And so. I think we can all agree that we're really excited for the grand design by our friend Joy Cowley. Oh, so we yes. Have a shout that out. was so that good. I got the book. Did, Did you read it early, both of yeah. you? Oh, I, my god! I got the privilege so of good. learning it. Joy Calloway, her new book comes out in a few weeks. Um, the grand design, it is a fantastic novel that looks at Dorothy Draper's life. Uh, so finally, um, Julie's popping back in. We have one more question that we missed here about the oh. writing process. So maybe both of you can you um i'm do you know what we can copy and put it in the facebook comments uh it's let's already go, there isn't it <laughs> let's go ahead and answer that question <laughs> okay i okay. i knew that we weren't going to be done in just 30 or 40 minutes <laughs> I, we're just going it's just so, so fascinating right julie <laughs> um but the question is um for both authors this is a multi-tiered question so perhaps we can just tackle Condense the it. layer cake uh icing on the top What's your favorite part of the writing process, research or the actual writing? Oh, um, the actual writing when it's going well. Um, though I do <laughs> like, I, I think that the second draft is often quite fun because there is the room for drafting new words, but you know where you're going and there's more direction. It's, a little, it's just a smoother process. I think second draft is quite fun. I agree. <laughs> no. that was a condensed I'm, version i know i love <laughs> the research i love the research i could research for 100 years and just keep researching and never write anything and never um, get anything on the page That's i me. get so impatient i have to start writing i get impatient i have to start writing and i i when i when that kicks in though you're right then i kind of abandon all of the research it's but i, I hate the first draft oh i hate it I hate it. I hate it. But I love, I love any revision. Like I could just revise until the end of time. So. Well, there's lots of people who are talking about um, the books that you've recommended. And so there's lots of everybody's liking certain ones, but Susie, I hope you didn't order um, the book woman's daughter from Warwick's that you didn't receive. So hopefully that didn't happen. But <laughs> you all had everybody. We had lots of people from all over the place from C uh, Susie from Seattle, Susan from New Jersey. We had Foxborough, Mass, um, British Columbia, uh, Missouri. It's like, it's really fun. That's why I love that's why I love these virtual events. Yeah, I love virtual fun. events. It's so much Me fun. Me too. Yeah, it's so much fun because everybody that, you know, because your book tours will probably keep you very regional to where you're at in person, yeah. but you're able to reach so many people this way. So it's so wonderful. Yes. So thank you, everybody. So like I said, Rachel, we probably could have gone thank for you. another. This was a Oh, really I get so excited. I'm just like, what? Well, it, and I love, I love that you took the deep dive into sensitivity um, readers, because I think that that is a really interesting part of what the discussion in publishing right now. And um, I think it's oh, sure. granted that not everybody knows what they are. So correct. Um, and, the, and, and I think that it helps readers understand that you all as authors are not just out there just doing this blindly without any kind yeah. of check 
and, and balance to it. And I think that that even adds more credence to the work that you all are producing. No one publishes in a silo. So the next time you go to Goodreads and are ready to sound off, remember that many, 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 many people for better or ill have read through the manuscript that has gotten to the part that it's at. Right. Um, So that's good. And and it's important to know that you don't know all of the author's story either. Um, You know, there's a story, you know, uh, people just assuming that the author is not, for example, that is writing about mental illness, that they're not suffering from it themselves. And the author has the right to a certain level of privacy and having to out themselves as, you know, struggling with um, an eating disorder, for example, um, it's, it's, that's not necessarily something that the reader needs to be privy to. Nor should so, yeah. yeah, and that's it's that's so, where we've so gotten hard. in the social in the social media world and this review world that we've gotten ourselves into. There is that that fourth dimension is 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 um, breaking down, and there seems to be this idea that you all owe us all this information, and I'm sorry, you no. you kind of don't. <laughs> you kind of don't. We um, love you, but we don't. Right, right, yeah. and there's and there's a. Can I just say that I hate the bad reviews too? It's just like I'm just I I know that everybody has an opinion, but we all don't need to hear it. Critical is great. <laughs> I mean, if it shows sometimes what somebody hated about a book is what makes me pick it up. But remember that correct. If you wouldn't say it to someone's face. Um, why would you bingo. say it? To and them? we're bingo, that's bingo, we're bingo. losing. That's something we're losing as a society is to remember that if you don't say it, if you're not willing to say it to somebody's face, you probably shouldn't say it at all. Yeah, decorum. And I know decorum when I'm looking at huge. reviews, when I'm looking at reviews, I look at the two and the four star reviews because the five star reviews are often, you know, the book gushes. It's like, okay, great. Right. And the one star reviews are mad at the world. Right. Um, because I don't think a book that's one star would have been published by a big house, by a house of any size. Um, It doesn't deserve one star, but the two stars and the four stars often have real arguments to be made. And so that's where I look if I'm on the fence about reading a book. Right. That's really good. Yeah. But I always feel like, and, 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 and as us as booksellers, I mean, we're very opinionated in our, you know, what we think about books in our world, but I always kind of tell our booksellers too. It's like, we're not critics. That's not our job, you know? And that's how I sort of feel about people who review books it's just like when they're spouting off it's just like your job's really not to be a critic I think it's like <laughs> if you feel what something compels something to say I think that that's great and that there's a forum for that um but yeah anyways I could go on and on about that that's <laughs> Oh, ladies, it was so wonderful having you. I know that you you are on different coasts. It's late where you're at. Um, Kimberly and and Amy, congratulations on the book. Thank good luck, you. Good luck. Thank good luck. You. And Rachel, I'm hoping we'll be seeing you again. Yeah. Tell me <laughs> someone to chat at. And I, will I know. Chat I love well, this. One, <laughs> you this got, I you're love great this, at it. You're excellent <laughs> at it. And I love that this came um as a suggestion from you all of coming to us so that i love it so bring it on like keep loving doing thank you we love warwick thank Thank you you so much all right thanks everybody have a great evening Bye. Bye -bye. bye